Hey folks, Uniservo here. Welcome to Vintage Computer Festival Midwest 2020 Virtual. I'm doing a video for this show about this IBM mainframe computer in my collection, a System 370 148. I've had a few requests for this, so uh, hey, why not? Anyway, this is a sort of late 1970s machine. It was developed out of Endicott, IBM Endicott, New York, where it was both developed and built. Introduced in 1976, they were starting to ship in 1977, and finally withdrawn in 1983. This is sort of a mid-range machine in, in the line. And interestingly, probably one of the last, possibly the last machine that was marketed strictly as a System 370. Um, the marketing lines had, had split at the time to the big machines, which were 3000 series, which were simply called 3033, 3081, 3090, and so forth. And the smaller machines, the 4300 series, 4321, 4361, 4381. So this is interesting that it's probably like one could say the last of the true 370s. It's also, I think, perhaps the last with a nice, nice front panel with Lincoln lights. And we love Lincoln lights. So like I said, a mid-range machine at the time for IBM. One or two megs of storage in this. I think this particular machine has one, but available in one or two. The uh, memory is not core, but is solid state, made out of 2K RAM chips, MOSFET-based RAM chips. The logic technology is MST, which is basically TTL, sort of like small-scale in uh, integration 7400 series TTL. However, it does come in those goofy little square aluminum packages. These machines ran OS VS1 or VM370 generally. I don't know how long they really lasted in service. I'm sure there were some that, that were working well beyond uh, the 1983 withdrawal date, but uh, you know, the, the taken over by the, the 4300 series, which kind of was the point of the 4300 series was to get rid of all these expensive blink and light machines into, well, frankly, kind of boring white and blue boxes. So I've had this machine for a bit of time. It's kind of been in storage. Uh, and it, it took me both fixing my truck and fixing my dock at the building here in order to get it in here. So I've been extremely busy in the past couple of weeks, not only with obviously, well, my business stuff, but just getting this machine into the building and off the truck and all that. Uh, so that's finally done. And hey, here it is. Now, I did actually make a video about this on my channel, the Uniservo channel. I believe it was called Someone Actually Bought a White One because, yeah, it's it's white. It's kind of an odd color for a 370. I've never seen a white 370. They're almost always blue or, or red or yellow. It's the only white one I've ever seen. Uh, but in any case, uh, go check out that video. I um, well, you can you can find it in my channel. I got it sort of on complete surprise. Someone called me out of the blue, knew that I was into IBM mainframe stuff, vintage IBM mainframe stuff, and uh, essentially wanted me to take over a deal. This was in Oklahoma. I believe it did work for the gas company in Oklahoma City, I, you know, the um, natural gas company. Um, he basically had found this 370-148 uh, stored in a garage in, outside of town. And um, the owner had died. The son was trying to get rid of it. The owner was actually the field engineer that took care of this machine when it was in service. Decided to take it home, apparently. I don't know if he purchased it from the, the gas company or IBM or, or whatever. I don't know, but he took it home. The nice thing about that, knowing that, is that 
being the guy that took care of it, he decommissioned it properly and took all the bits and pieces you need. And uh, including, probably most importantly, he actually took the power supply, the motor generator. The, it's called a 3047. And honestly, most people, when they save a 360 or a 370, they didn't bother with the motor generator. There are so many of the 360s and 370s in captivity that don't have the power supply, essentially. Yeah, you can kind of get away without having it, but you have to make high-frequency high AC. Not an easy thing. Anyway, I got the whole thing because the deal he was making with the then-owner of the machine kind of fell apart. And, well, let's just say I had to take over the deal very quickly. <laughs> and, yes, it was a very expensive machine, you know, for, for, a, for an old computer. And I had to pretty much sell my stock of, my strategic stock of World War II 6SN7 GT radio tubes to pay for it. So, yeah, it took two weeks. I had two weeks to raise the money and get it out of there or it was going to get beheaded. It was going to get scrapped and the, the front panel put onto eBay. So, kind of a true rescue. It's very stressful, but somehow we managed to pull it off. So what we are going to do in this video is kind of a show and tell. Now, certainly there are lots of pictures on the, on the internet about the System 37148, but they are all kind of overview. Maybe the IBM White Room picture or, you know, a whole data center. You get to see the machine, the big boxes. Well, today we're actually going to go under the covers because, well, that's what we like to see, all the details. And it's kind of the stuff that you don't find on the net. So, uh, yeah, I will be going to a lot of the various bits and pieces, the different frames. This is actually made of three, what they're called, frames plus a motor generator, a frame being basically a big box. And I've open the lids and take you inside uh, all sorts of angles and show you what is what. Now, be warned that this is a completely unrestored machine. No, I will not be firing it up <laughs> today. So sorry about that. That'll have to wait. But uh, completely unrestored, as found, you're going to find in the video evidence of, well, a few mice. It's really not too bad but also some of those mud wasp things that live in Oklahoma that make little nests. I notice there's a few of those in here. The damage is really very minimal, actually. It's just going to be dirty, so just be warned of that. Okay, let's start. Let's start at the best part, the front panel. As you can see, it's a classic black front panel. 360 panels were white. 370 panels were generally black. Yeah, there were a couple times when things got mixed up, but yeah, general rule of thumb. 370 black, 360 white. I tend to like the 370 panels. I think they tend to be a little more colorful. Maybe it's the black background. They're also a little more conservative, maybe, in design. And uh, I just like the look. Well, let's take a look. A close look. Yes, blinking lights. We love our blinking lights. And you can see we have rows of them with the orange ones being parodies, you can see. But also, if you look here, the legends here, these actually rotate and change to one of eight different settings. Now, there's supposed to be a knob on the side, and uh, unfortunately, the knob's not there. You can see the hole. But you can actually have these blinking lights here, this row and over, kind of do octuple duty by switching around the legend. And uh, because, hey, these front panels were expensive. They were, they were manufacturing headache. And let's face it, they weren't really making any money for IBM. These were a maintenance tool. I mean, maybe the customers liked them, they were pretty, but 
they were mostly not allowed to touch them, <laughs> except for a couple of, uh, you know, very, very simple maintenance maybe. But these were mostly the, the field engineer's uh, domain. So IBM started to economize, let's just say. Uh, I think these were on some 360s, but yes, it was to cut down the number of Blinken lights. Now, of course, there are switches and rotary switches. Here we have a bunch of the red lights, which are generally bad news. Checks and such like that. You can see power, thermal, and all that. And the ubiquitous emergency pull knob. You get to pull it once, <laughs> and, then, and then the field engineer has to come and reset it. Yeah, sometimes people would cover that, put a plexiglass cover, because there, there were more than a few stories of take your kid to work, and <laughs> hey, what's this cool red thing? Pulls it, and disaster. And of course, we have some hour meters. You can see, yes, machine type 3148, number 20467. And um, it's hard to say what number this really is. IBM had a tendency to block out serials, so there may have been a bunch that started out at 10,000 and a bunch that started out at 20,000. Maybe some started out at one. I don't know. But this might be the 20,000 block. Number 467, who knows? But the top is processing time and the bottom is maintenance time. And we can see this cool sticker here in the shape of a punch card. Wonder if that number works anymore. Classic rectangular numbers, or uh, the buttons rather. And some lights. And of course, the hex rotary switches. They had gotten rid of most of the toggle switches and went with this hex design. So as you can see, it goes 0 through F, 16 positions. And we got more cool buttons and stuff like that. Back here is kind of neat. This switch here, when you're setting the time of day, you got to... You gotta hold that switch down so uh, so you just don't go changing the time on everyone. Now there is a little secret with this panel. It gets better. <laughs> yes, more stuff. As you can see, yeah, operator and CE, customer engineer. A lot of times customer engineer and field engineer are kind of interchangeable. But here you can see another one of those legends, changeable legends. And here you can see there's an internal knob, which, here, you can see I can change what the blinking lights do. So, the interesting thing is, even though this says System 370148, guess what? It's not a 370. It's not a 370 inside. It only looks and smells and feels like a 370. Inside is a very interesting architecture. It's a uh, very different micro engine and it emulates a 370. Let's look at some of the documentation. Of course, the guy took kind of all the documentation. This is just some of it. And I have, I think, I think I have the whole set. Uh, all the ALDs, all the maintenance stocks, and so forth. I have the microcode. I have the microcode printed out. And I think I even have the microcode source. Let's take a look at that microcode engine. So looking in one of the big blue binders, we can see the basic idea here. We've got the 370 microprogram. Munch of micro routines composed of control words. And the micro engine, well, it kind of looks like this. I'll maybe scan around so you can see it because the, the printing is kind of tiny here. But uh, yeah, this is kind of general purpose, sort of. 
but it is not a 370. Now, in some sources, you hear about the System 380, and including the Model 370 148, is sort of lumped into that. Now, the thing is that the System 380 wasn't ever really an official IBM term. It seems to have risen in the industry independently. Maybe the, uh, the industry, the press, got a hold of, of this new machine here and this new way of doing things. Although, mind you, some 360s were also kind of interesting and not 360s in the inside either. Talk about that later. But uh, these 370s, which were not really 370s, they just looked like them. A lot, a lot of the press dubbed that the 380. And I don't know if it ever got IBM's official blessing. But the interesting thing is, of course, years later, they come out with officially with the System 390. So a lot of people wonder, well, what about the 380? Well, it kind of is this weird ghost. It probably didn't really happen, but it sort of did. Was this part of it? I just don't know. In any case, yes, this machine, here's some of the source. I guess this is an example page of, uh, well, the microcode. And, yeah, basically, you, uh, you're emulating... A 370. Okay, time to look at the insides. I know a lot of you guys have been waiting for this. Open the hatches. And we can see the gates. Now, a gate in IBM speak is a swing-out chassis that holds electronics. In this case, this gate, or actually a pair of gates, and I'll show you that in a minute, contains the logic, all the logic cards. They're... They have covers here to keep the airflow nice and unfortunately is full of awful IBM foam. Here are the cards. Let's take out D. And as you can see, it's got a bunch of the aluminum chips. This is not SLT, this is MST. MST is basically TTL. They are integrated circuits rather than the hybrid technology of the 360s. Let's put this up top for now because this is a little hard to get the cards back in one-handed. I'll show you how the gate swings out. There's a big handle here. Unlock it. And this is an extremely heavy piece. You can see two gates. One here, one here. And... The latch down there is supposed to come apart, but it is currently stuck, so I need to work on that. But that's how you separate the gates. They're more or less mirror images, although clearly the logic is different uh, on each side. But in between, you can see the backplanes. There really is not much else inside of the cabinet other than you get to see the backside of the panel kind of covered up there. You can also see the track at which this rides because this gate, I mean, it really must... It must weigh 800 pounds. Button that up and let's go look at the power supplies. And on this side, does actually have a little airspace in here, but it's all power supplies. Large heat sinks, some very large assemblies down there. All the air is ducted, so the proper pieces get cooled. And of course, more breakers, because hey, power supplies need breakers. There's a weird box there, MG convert box. I'm not sure what that is, but it's clearly for the motor generator. Sort of looks like an afterthought. Maybe it is. But serious, serious power to get this machine going. Okay, let's look at the console. 
Here it is, and yes indeed, it looks like a 3270-style terminal. It more or less is, but it's been modified. The most obvious part to be modified is, of course, that keyboard. And you can see, well, the base of the thing is absolutely huge. This is because it is part of the desk. It actually mounts from underneath with a bunch of bolts. And I'll tell you, it was really not fun getting that thing mounted by myself. Why? That does not come off. That is bolted to that large square white thing there. You can see we have our uh, standard nice clicky keyboard and uh, nothing really on the back. All the uh, connections are from underneath. There is actually a way to get into there and take everything apart. However, it was shipped to me basically all put together, although not on the desk here, it was on the motor generator, and I had to mount it on this desk. Underneath the console is a small gate with oh, a bunch of cards, basically, for the uh, console here. And you can see we have our connections to the tube. And over there, kind of buried away, is a power supply. Now looking at the back of the console, we can see where that gate is with the cards. And we can open it up to show you the cards. And of course, a bunch of the horrible, horrible IBM foam. It's going to be fun to clean up. But of course, we also have this very nice little hidden control panel. Now, this is for the console and for the 3203 printers, which I don't know if this machine did not have them or uh, or they ne they ne the guy never took them, but no, thir no 3203s for me. But yes, we have a nice little panel with your very typical IBM switches and for some reason it's on this strange sort of <laughs> vibrating bracket thing. I don't know why they sort of cheaped out there. I don't know why. Could be more solid, guys. And right over here is the console file drive. Yes, an 8-inch floppy drive. And this is where the microcode disk goes and also the disks for the uh, diagnostics. Why they put them in the back here, I am not sure. Possibly because it's somewhere you really shouldn't be going to unless you really know what you're doing. And uh, one thing about the doors on this is they do have these little locking things, so you just can't open them willy-nilly. You have to turn the screwdriver and go into the little handle bit. Okay, let's look at the 3047 power unit. Basically a motor generator. And it is a pretty featureless white box. In fact, you only get one light. And inside the featureless white box is a featureless blue box. This actually contains the motor generator set. The motor is a three-phase type. I believe this is a 208 volt machine. And you feed in an awful lot of amps and it spins a high frequency AC generator. I believe this is 415 Hertz. I think that was standard for IBM. Why they didn't pick the standard industry 400 Hertz is beyond me. It might just be IBM being IBM. In any case, the reason for generating such a high frequency for power, the line power, is it's much easier on the power supplies to filter that all down to nice clean DC. You also might be wondering why a motor generator in a late 70s machine? Well, you know, this was probably one of the last uh, IBM uh, mainframes to use a motor generator. Some of the 
really big ones might have. But the thing about the motor generator is if, if they're maintained properly, and of course this one would have been being in, uh, you know, under IBM's control with a, with a, a field engineer, a motor generator will outlast the pyramids. Just keep them lubed up, check the brushes every so often. And one of the nice things is if the uh, power, incoming power to the building drops a cycle or two, this will just keep spinning and it'll give you a little bit of kind of an uninterruptible power supply. You can also see in the corner, bottom corner there, the main breakers. You can see three phases. There's also a tiny, tiny little switch. I'm not sure what that does yet. Okay, here we have the rear of the motor generator. And as you can see, the large blue box that actually contains the motor and generator with a few wires coming in and out. Small fuse box there, way to the side. And yes, a couple of very large connectors, a Russell and Stahl there, and a smaller circular connector. And you can see those are how you get the power in and power out of the motor generator. I wouldn't be surprised if there are some filter boxes behind those smaller blue bits. You can see they give you a little cutout in the cabinet to route the power cables down into the floor. Okay, now we are at the back frame of the 3148 processing unit. And what we see is kind of a lot of air. Now, there is a lot of space in here for options and goodies. This machine does not have. I suppose you could probably put RPQs, custom hardware, in here as well. There's also some uh, cable connections. But mostly the fun stuff is all of this. This is all power handling equipment. Power cycling or bringing up the power on one of these IBM mainframes is, is, is quite the, the, the song and dance act. Everything is sequenced. Everything is checked. There are relays all over the place. You can see a nice panel here for uh, showing off what's going on or what's going wrong. And we have a gate, which we can open. And we can see, yes, there are cards down in there. And relays. There are relays all over the place. And uh, basically, this accepts the power from the motor generator. And upon getting a, basically a signal from the operator to power up the machine, this does its whole act and checks everything. And eventually, the machine will power up. Now, uh, one nice thing about these IBM mainframes, or mostly any of the, the higher-end IBM stuff, is you don't really have to worry too much about a power supply component failing and taking absolutely everything out and just destruction everywhere. This is because in these machines, everything is checked. Checked, checked, and checked again. And if anything is out of order, it will shut down in a fail-safe manner. And most of the time, no damage happens. Or the damage is very, very minimally uh, spread across the machine. It's just, it's just kind of localized, maybe I should say. So, uh, yes, all this stuff, and I mean, none of this is the actual real power supply. The power supplies, as you can see, are over there in the first uh, uh, frame. These are just sequencing, and we'll see more of that when we go to the other side. Here on the other side of the frame, you can see a lot of fuses and breakers. And if I open it up, well, you see an awful lot of fuses and breakers and all the stuff, some filtering there for the line, all sorts of power handling. We even go further down here and uh, see if I can get to it here. Step switches, sort of like those old telephone things. 
These are for sequencing power. And you can see here, a bunch of connections. So uh, yes, is you wanted to uh, power up your entire system, you connect to these connectors, and uh, that will tell various things like tape drives, strings of DASD, whatever, to power up in whatever order. Order being determined by the, uh, the stepping there. Let's see if we can get in there a little closer. There we go. And yes, you can see in the base some of the monster power cables that I have to figure out and decode where they go. And of course, lots more bits of sheet metal that I have to figure out where they go too. And a handy dandy outlet. Okay, so there we have it. Finally, I got my hands on a real Blinkin' Lights 370. And uh, quite a manageable one, I think. It's not so super big, although, yeah, I wouldn't pass up a, a 168 or something like that. Uh, not so big to be completely out of hand, uh, yet kind of big enough. And yeah, it's a project. Actually, it's probably a project and a half. Might be two projects worth of project. I mean, yeah, condition is yeah, kind of fair. Not too bad, but not too great. You can see there was evidence of mouse and mud wasp or whatever. You know, all the goodies that were living in Oklahoma. I didn't see anything in the way of real bad corrosion, uh, you know, due to urine or whatever, or water for that matter. In fact, a lot of the, what you think was corrosion on this video actually just rubs off. It just seems to be dirt. Um, so yeah, there's going to be a lot of cleaning involved with this machine and a lot of taking it apart <laughs> and uh, putting it back together. And, you know, hoping there's nothing like a real showstopper. I don't think so. Really, you know, most of the parts are findable. You know, even all that, all those little logic modules, they're, they were standard parts. I've, I've got zillions of those little aluminum cans. They're, they're just like TTL. So what am I going to do with this? Well, I'm going to obviously try and make a system. I actually have plenty of peripherals to go with this. Uh, in fact, the... Uh, that 2914 there that you see with all the power plugs on top of it, uh, that's going to be extremely handy for a lot of the systems because that's basically a channel crossbar switch. Bus, bus and tag channel crossbar. Very handy, actually. But, hey, I've got uh, tape control and tapes. So the good old 3803 and 3420. I've got actually too many of those things uh, for discs. I've got our DASD, as I should really call them. I do have a 3830 and a string of 3350s, which are somewhat contemporaneous with uh, this machine here. Uh, 3830s, maybe a little on the on the getting old side, but hey, the the uh, that that was the disc controller at the time. Uh, let's see, I've got the 3272 IO. Thing for talking to more terminals and uh, let's see punch cards I've got the 3525 and 3505 system for a reader and punch and uh, let's see what else uh, I could throw on a few more things probably uh, but I could make a decent little system yeah little it's still going to be pretty big and I'm finding out how ju just how small this room is <laughs> with, with this monster. Oh, boy. So, yes, I can actually come up with a decent-looking system. Uh, all different colors, too. Blue, white, red, everything. Now, yeah, one thing about this is you will notice that this, this is a white one. And, okay, it's not the most dramatic IBM color. I am going to keep it white. I will very likely repaint it simply because the paint's not great. It's, it's scuffed up and it really is showing its age. 
it's yellowing basically uh it may not show up on the video that way but uh hey you know it's, it's white paint is easy so i may do that i've got a little bit of a uh, sheet metal work to do on the motor generator i'm probably farm that out to someone that knows what they're doing as far as taking real dents out that's really the only serious mechanical damage to this yeah i got a few parts to find like a knob or two and it's all the usual kind of stuff. It's going to take a long time. Don't expect me to get to this right away. I uh, This is probably going to really wait, um, gosh, I don't know, a year or two before I really start in on it. You know, I'm kind of overloaded right now, and uh, I've got plenty of projects uh, kind of ahead of it. And let's face it, this is going to be a very, very complex project so uh hey you know i'll keep making videos and i may actually cut a new version of this video for my channel this this video i believe will stay on vcf midwest's channel well, probably forever and that's that's cool that's fine but i probably will recut uh or redo this video for my channel uniservo and, uh, hey, I urge you to walk on over there and see what that channel's all about. So I've got uh, oh, a bunch of videos and, of well, dubious quality maybe. And this is actually the first I've actually put some real editing effort into. And it's, yeah, it's not that great, but, hey, I'm learning. I'm learning. Uh, but, yeah, a lot of videos on vintage IBM stuff and uh, vintage control data, and old radios and tubes and stuff like that. So, hey, why not go and check it out and subscribe and all that? And, yeah, eventually there will be a video series about this 370-148. Okay, hey, if you uh, like the video, why not give a like and uh, say good things about Vintage Computer Fest Midwest. They're good people, and I... Thank them for giving me this opportunity to make a video. Yeah, it's a shame we couldn't be there in person because it's a great show, I'm telling you. Well, you know, maybe 2021. Let's hope for that. All right. And also, of course, you know, for all the people that have been uh, watching and leaving comments and all that good stuff, thank you as well. I'll try and answer what I can. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of this machine that I don't have quite right or uh, need to learn about. Uh, but I'll, I'll do my best. Okay, see you later. Bye-bye.